From the Prairies to the Trenches, Part 5 Amiens, Armistice, and Aftermath January 1918 to June 1919 January 1918 saw the Great War enter its fifth year. The Canadian Corps was recuperating from the hard-fought battles of Vimy Ridge, Hill 70, and Passchendaele. By the end of 1917, Canada had suffered over 35,000 killed and wounded. The Swanston brothers from Maryton, Saskatchewan, were keenly aware of the losses among their group who had enlisted during the first days of the war. In January, Vic, Ern, and the other remaining old sweats from the 5th Battalion had a group photo taken, which displays in sharp contrast the casualties they had suffered since arriving in France three years earlier. With the war's end nowhere in sight, morale among many of the veteran soldiers began to flag. The enthusiasm that had colored their sense of adventure back in 1914 gave way to disillusionment, fatigue, and despondency. In France, with his battalion, Vic confided in his diary. January 28th, 1918. Heavy shelling for the past 10 days. Commencing to wonder how the deuce some of us old-timers escape getting hit. The same old gang go from week to week without a casualty, while other men are getting it all the time. February 17th, 1918. It was read out in orders today that all the original married men who came over in 1914 hold themselves in readiness to go on leave to Canada. So I guess we single men who came out here are all out of luck. It wouldn't have hurt the damn government to let the single men go. There are only a few of us left, and more or less used up anyway. We've all been out here four years now, and our luck can't hold out forever. In the summer of 1917, faced with heavy losses and diminishing enlistments, the Canadian government passed the Military Service Act, allowing the conscription of eligible men for service overseas. By February 1918, it was clear that the first wave of conscription had generated less than half of the 100,000 men that the government had hoped to draft. The pressure to increase these numbers and to arrest suspected draft dodgers triggered rioting in Quebec City, which continued from March the 28th to April 1st. When the government intervened to subdue the rioters, at least four civilians were killed and many others were wounded and jailed. On April the 20th, with the full pressure of the German offensive being felt, the Canadian government cancelled all conscription exemptions, including those previously granted to farmers and farm workers. This move angered many and led to further protests by farmers in Ontario and Quebec. However, in Western Canada, organizations like the Saskatchewan Grain Growers Association did not lend official support to the protests. While the government actions and the responses from the agricultural community increased tensions, the farming exemptions were not brought back. After the collapse of the Russian army in 1917 and the beating back of the Italians in the Alps, the Germans were able to concentrate their resources on the Western Front. An all-out assault was conceived to strike a decisive blow against the Allies. To the German high command, this was a decision born of necessity. The entry of the United States into the war provided the Allies with huge drafts of material and manpower which would soon tip the balance in their favor. Put in stark terms, Germany needed to strike now or lose the war. General Ludendorff, the architect of German strategy, devised the spring offensive, relying heavily on a huge assault spearheaded by highly motivated, heavily armed attack formations, the Sturmtruppen or Stormtroopers. His plan called for these units to use independent tactical initiative, overwhelm frontline troops, bypass Allied strong points, and strike deep into vulnerable rear areas. With this strategy, follow on assault waves would exploit these successes and mop up isolated enemy formations. As Ludendorff wrote in his war diary, We will chop a hole, the rest will follow. The German offensive was launched on March the 21st against British forces in the Somme theater of operations. The attack achieved tremendous initial success, sweeping aside British formations, striking deep into rear echelons, and threatening to completely split the Allied line. The attack's quickness and ferocity caused a near panic amongst the Allies, with General Haig issuing a fatalistic special order of the day on April 11th that stated, with our backs to the wall and believing in the justice of our cause, 
each one of us must fight on to the end. Nonetheless, even with its early successes, the German plan had several critical flaws. While Ludendorff gave his leading units tactical control to go where their success took them, they naturally avoided hardened areas, and so their erratic advance made it very difficult for German headquarters to formulate and maintain coherent control of the situation as it developed. More importantly, the leading German troops quickly began to run out of supplies needed to sustain their advance. So despite the initial German victories, the Allies' resolve held, the German stormtrooper assaults began to falter, and the crisis began to ebb. In a desperate attempt to maintain the advantage, Ludendorff initiated a succession of offensives which continued into the middle of July. As they were not in these targeted areas, the Canadian Corps came through largely unscathed. British High Command began planning to temporarily break up the Canadian contingent and assign its component divisions to assist in the defence where required. However, General Curry pushed back, arguing that his men would fight better as a unified national force. Annoyed, General Haig wrote in his war diary, I could not help feeling that some people in Canada regard themselves as allies rather than fellow citizens of the Empire. Nonetheless, he would accept Curry's suggestion, ordering the Canadians to prepare for a counteroffensive, being planned for later that summer. While battles raged along the trench lines, the struggle also extended in the air above. Allied pilots had distinguished themselves in dogfights and raids, but the events of 1918 strained their abilities and endurance to the limit. Despite technical advancements, flying conditions still took a harsh toll on pilots. Sam and Neil Taylor from Yellowgrass, Saskatchewan, had both enlisted in 1916 and joined what would soon become the Royal Air Force. In 1917, Neil had been shot down over Cambrai and taken prisoner. Sam continued the fight, honing his skills and proving himself a skilled fighter pilot. Pilots in the air in 1918 could find themselves in many dangerous situations, from aerial combat to mechanical failure. While parachutes were issued to German pilots, British authorities refused to allow their airmen to use them, fearing that damaged planes would be abandoned rather than landed. As a result, many pilots were lost going down with their machines. Sam Taylor was one of them. On July 7th, he was shot down near the front lines in northern France and died in the crash. At the Holtzminden prisoner of war camp in Germany, Neil received word of his brother's death. Fellow officer R.M. Foster wrote to him of Sam's final flight. Sammy, your brother, was out with two others on wireless interception and attacking Hun artillery machines. He attacked one of their artillery machines and chased him several miles behind the lines. Apparently he failed to see a large number of enemy biplanes which were above him and between him and the sun. These machines immediately dived and attacked as Sammy turned and attacked a biplane which he shot down and which was seen to crash by our people in the trenches. Unfortunately, another enemy machine got behind him and shot him down. He crashed right in our front line near Amel, northeast of villers bretonneux The Australians got him out during the night and found that he had been instantly killed. He was buried just behind Amel and his grave registered. I have no doubt that your brother would leave very shortly for the Distinguished Flying Cross. He was extraordinarily brave and by far the best I've ever had in my flight. Sam would posthumously be awarded the French Croix de Guerre. The German spring offensives had inflicted considerable casualties and flooded Allied hospitals with wounded troops. To make matters worse, the intensification of German air raids on the Western Front meant that the British and Canadian hospitals in France were under increasing threat of attack. Military hospitals were part of a network of camps and stations responding to the medical needs of Allied troops. Assigned to the No. 3 Canadian General Hospital, nursing sister Gladys Matheson from Onion Lake, Saskatchewan, arrived in France and took up her post on May 9, 1918. No. 3 Canadian General Hospital consisted of groups of huts, each unit of three making up a ward. I was assigned to duty in Ward O, reserved for medical cases, pneumonia and such illnesses, or shell shock. 
which we were only beginning to recognize as serious illness. Each hut was built to accommodate about 25 cases. Heavy convoys of wounded men came from the front, and they had to be crowded in wherever there was space, even for stretchers. On Sunday night, May the 19th, we experienced our first air raid. Several girls went to the dugouts, but we were there only briefly. There were crowded and quite inadequate shelters. They were only a few feet underground with sandbags piled over the roof that could protect against shrapnel, but never against a bomb itself. That night, however, we were only on the fringe of the air raid, which was directed against Etop a few miles away. The hospitals there suffered heavy casualties. Two of our own Canadian sisters were killed, and another died later of wounds. She was Margaret Lowe, my senior at the Winnipeg General Hospital, a lovely girl whom I had always admired. Over the two-hour raid, 15 German aircraft had dropped 116 bombs on ATAP. They hit 10 Canadian and British hospitals, resulting in 840 casualties among staff, patients, and civilians. These attacks were not to be the last. Nurses and other medical staff continued their work under constant threat of attack. It might seem that at times we could put all that from our thoughts, but it was there. How could we be unaware as bombing continued and convoy after convoy brought wounded and sick men to our crowded wards? Marquees had to be erected just outside the huts to take the overflow. And when air raid warnings sounded, we would hurriedly bring those patients on stretchers or walk in the short distance to lie on the floor of the huts that had only the slight protection of sandbags as high as the windows. The bravery and selfless conduct of the nurses under such stressful and dangerous conditions did not go unnoticed. Seven nursing sisters and one matron would become the first Canadian women to be decorated for gallantry, with each being awarded the military medal in 1919. Along with illness and injuries, many of the men arriving at military hospitals were disabled by shell shock, a newly recognized ailment brought on by the highly intense nature of modern warfare. Robert Kolbeck of the 46th Battalion recalled the reactions of a fellow soldier. The sergeant sent myself and another little fellow to get water. We had just gone a little way when a jerry shell exploded about a half a mile away. This fellow with me, he shouted, They've got us! and dived into a bunch of willows. I stood there. I could not believe what I had seen. I did not know he was shell-shocked. When he came out of the bushes, he was shaking like a leaf and was as white as a sheet. Three years in the front line, and he never got a scratch. He told me every time they went over, or in the line, he prayed that he would get hit. That little fellow just lay on the ground quivering. He could not even hold his rifle, the poor guy. I was sure sorry for him. At the time, shell shock was often interpreted as shirking, perhaps even cowardice, and the lack of understanding about this condition amongst military officials could have tragic consequences. Soldiers caught leaving their posts could be court-martialed and executed by firing squad. Twenty-three Canadians met this end, most condemned for desertion, and it is likely that many of them were suffering from shell shock. Years later, shell shock would become more widely known and accepted as post-traumatic stress disorder. Soldiers in the trenches were also susceptible to serious physical illnesses, including a severe strain of influenza, which spread through the Western Front in 1918. Sergeant Jacob Miller from Newdorf, Saskatchewan, newly promoted and assigned to one of the military dressing stations, was stationed near the town of Lille, France, when the virus hit. The flu broke out in full force and was soon raging badly amongst our men. The cold, wet weather was a potent factor in aggravating the scourging plague to greater fury. Ambulances were busy, running night and day, carrying out the sick men. Alan and I kept going from one villa to another, administering whatever medical treatment we could, and gathering up the critical cases to be shipped out to the hospitals. 
We hardly slept day or night. Now and then, we were able to snatch a few minutes' rest, only to be roused out of our slumber by another call. Day after day, the same steady grind. I wondered how long it would last until our ranks would be depleted entirely. The flu epidemic had a strategic effect on the summer battles of 1918. Among the British divisions, the sickness affected around 15% of the men. However, the Germans, who were eking by on a substandard diet due to the naval blockade, suffered far more. It is estimated that as many as 2,000 men per division were down with the illness. By mid-July, Germany's manpower advantage had been largely spent, and its supplies and troops were exhausted from repeated attacks. Detecting this, the Allied commander-in-chief, General Ferdinand Foch, ordered a combined French and American counter-offensive near Paris, which led to the successful Second Battle of the Marne, which lasted from the 18th of July until the 6th of August. The Germans reeled from the ferocity of the counter-attack, and in only three weeks of fighting they were thrown back to the positions that they had held in early spring. While the Second Battle of the Marne raged, Foch urged his fellow allies to press the offensive. Haig agreed and ordered the Australians and Canadians to get ready to form the spearhead of the assault. The Battle of Amiens began on the 8th of August and became the first phase of what would be known as the 100 Days Campaign, which would culminate in the end of the war. The Swanston brothers and their 5th Battalion were among those sent to Amiens. On their arrival, Vic wrote in his diary, August 8th, 1918. We spent the last six days getting here from near Ra, took the train at St. Paul, and went north nearly to the coast. It was dark when we got there. All our movements were kept secret. Nobody knew where we were going. Loaded on another train and traveled all night, unloaded at an out-of-the-way siding, and stayed there until dark. Traveled all night again, marching towards the front. In the daytime, our wagons were covered with green boughs, and everything kept out of sight of enemy planes. No fires were allowed, and every man had a slip of paper given to him telling him to keep his mouth shut. Then we heard that the 5th were going over the top. Over the past three years, the Canadian Corps had created a reputation as the crack assault troops of the Allied forces, and so the High Command knew it had to mask any movements of the Canadians, as the Germans would immediately become suspicious. Accordingly, a detachment of two infantry battalions, a wireless unit, and a casualty clearing station were sent to the front near Ypres to bluff the Germans into thinking that the entire Canadian Corps was moving north to Flanders, when in fact they moved all four infantry divisions to Amiens without being detected by the Germans. Breaking from established doctrine, there were no day-long bombardments to alert the defenders, only a relatively brief, furious shelling immediately prior to the assault. At zero hour, August the 8th, Allied artillery opened fire and silenced 504 of the 530 German guns, while a creeping barrage protected Allied soldiers as they advanced. The Canadians and Australians, supported by hundreds of tanks, captured their first objectives early in the morning. The speed of the Canadian advance was such that a party of German officers and some divisional staff were captured while eating breakfast. Follow-on Allied units exploited the attack's success, creating by the end of the day a breach 24 kilometers long through the German lines. With the way open, Allied cavalry continued the advance, with RAF aircraft and armored car fire keeping the retreating Germans from rallying. By the end of the first day, Allied forces had pushed on average approximately 11 kilometers into enemy territory, with the Canadians gaining 13 kilometers. The assaulting forces had taken 16,000 prisoners, with the Germans losing an estimated 30,000 soldiers. Five German divisions had effectively been engulfed. The British, Australian and Canadian infantry of the 4th Army sustained about 8,000 casualties, with further losses by tank and air personnel and French forces. General Ludendorff described this first day of Amiens as the black day of the German army not because of the ground lost to the advancing allies, but because the morale of the German troops had sunk to the point where large numbers of troops began to capitulate. The advance continued on the 9th of August, although without the spectacular results of the previous day. The infantry had outrun their supporting artillery, and the initial force of more than 500 tanks had been reduced to six battle-ready tanks. 
On the Canadian front, congested roads and communication problems prevented men from being able to push forward rapidly enough to maintain the momentum of the advance. Nonetheless, by the 10th of August, there were signs that the Germans were pulling out of the salient they had possessed in the early spring. According to official reports, the Allies had captured nearly 50,000 prisoners and 500 guns by the 27th of August. The Battle of Amiens was an unmitigated success and set the tempo for the next three months of Allied operations, a series of battles which would break the Germans' will to carry on. Back home in Saskatchewan, the summer of 1918 saw a July frost which destroyed wheat crops in the north of the province, while a drought reduced yields in the west down to about 10 bushels an acre. As Deputy Minister of Agriculture, Charles Dunning stated, The crop season opened favorably with res respect to weather conditions, but as a result of numerous enlistments and the operation of the Military Service Act, laborers for seeding were scarce and expensive besides being somewhat inexperienced. Employment agencies were operating in full force to ensure that labor needs were addressed in all departments. Despite best efforts, the crop of 1918 would turn out to be one of the poorest in years. In some areas, the wheat was entirely destroyed. Women were increasingly called upon to fill gaps in the workforce, not only supporting agricultural production, but also taking on various other occupations in towns and cities across the province. The increased demand for women to work outside the home led to the creation of the Minimum Wage Act, which fixed the hours and conditions of labor for women working in urban settings. The manpower shortage and an increased cost of living resulted in further development of labor unions across the country. Strikes became more commonplace, and general unrest spread among the population in Canada. In 1918, there were nine strikes in Saskatchewan alone. As the cost of the war took its toll on communities, public hostility towards those seen as having enemy ancestry increased. While the 1917 Wartime Elections Act had effectively disenfranchised many citizens who had emigrated from enemy nations, in 1918 public pressure compelled the government to further limit the freedoms of many minority groups. Publications printed in languages other than English came under particular scrutiny. At this time, Saskatchewan was home to several German-language newspapers, including the Regina-based De Courier and the Munster-based St. Petersburg. By the end of September 1918, the Canadian government had banned all publications in so-called enemy languages, including German, Ukrainian, and Russian. On September 7th, the German Supreme Command ordered the German army to begin falling back to the Hindenburg Line hoping that the Allies would be unable to break through and that the Germans could hold out for some form of negotiated peace. The hard fighting that erupted across the Western Front in late September stretched German reserves to the breaking point and threatened to bring about the complete disintegration of the Front. This was mirrored in the Balkans in Middle East, as Bulgaria and Turkey, both allies of Germany, were effectively knocked out of the war by devastating Allied offensives. On the evening of September the 28th, Ludendorff went to see the chief of the general staff, Paul von Hindenburg, and told him that Germany must seek peace as soon as possible. On September the 29th, the Supreme Army Command informed the Kaiser and the Imperial Chancellor that the military situation was hopeless. General Ludendorff said that he could not guarantee to hold the front for another 24 hours and demanded that Germany request an immediate ceasefire. The first serious peace overture by Germany was sent to President Wilson on October the 4th, accepting his 14 points as the basis for seeking favorable terms. They were gravely disappointed when the Allied generals, hardened by over four years of war, demanded the unconditional surrender of the Central Powers. This marked the beginning of a spiraling series of events that would include the collapse of the Austrian Empire, the mutiny of the German Navy, and the abdication of the Kaiser. Ultimately, the German delegation resigned itself to accepting unconditional surrender and signed the armistice in the early hours of November the 11th. On the morning of November the 11th, Jacob Miller was with his division in Belgium, preparing to enter the city of Mons. We packed our equipment and waited for the order to fall in, 
Everything was quiet and placid. Not one shot was fired. The hours passed. Nine o'clock, ten o'clock, eleven o'clock, and still no orders. I wonder what's wrong, I said to Alan. Before he could reply, there was a loud shout outside. Skinny came dashing into our kitchen as if there were ten devils after him. Peace, Miller. Peace is declared, he shouted excitedly. I gazed at him in amazement. Then a thought dawned upon me. Poor Skinny. It was getting to him, too. The door opened and the doctor came in, smiling joyously. He stretched out his hand to me. Sergeant, the war is over. They signed an armistice at eleven o'clock this morning. I smiled at him and shook my head. I can't believe it. Yes, it's true at last. We shall have our dinner and then go to Mont. He turned and skipped through the door like an excited rabbit. The Swanston brothers were in France when word reached them. Vic wrote in his diary, The war ended. Thank God for that. Orders came to cease fire at 11.30 a.m. Big inspection at 12.30. It lasted until dark. Rained hard all afternoon. Flares going up all over the country. Seems funny not to hear any gunfire. Nobody seems to realize that the war has really ended. Everyone got an extra big drink of rum tonight. Some talk of us going to Germany. I hope not. Have been here long enough and want to go back home. The 46th Battalion was near Valenciennes, France, on the morning of the 11th. Pat Gleason remembered that day. When the armistice was signed, I was out to the ranges that morning with ammunition at 11 o'clock, and everything stopped. And I'll tell you that I don't know. I still think that rough and tough as they were, that they were all saying a little silent prayer that, of thanksgiving that it was finished. But there was no... No celebrating there that night at all. There was more celebrations going on in Canada and England than there were over in France. It, it was just too, too hard to realize, you know. During the final months of the war, the highly contagious influenza that had afflicted the soldiers began to strengthen and spread into civilian populations. The so-called Spanish flu had mutated into a strain that proved to be uncommonly deadly to otherwise healthy young adults. Records suggest that this second wave of the illness had entered Canada by late September, with Saskatchewan seeing its first confirmed cases by early October. Within weeks, hundreds of people in the province were reported to be infected. Overseas near Cambrai, Jacob Miller had news from home. I received a long letter from my mother. A terrible epidemic was sweeping throughout my hometown and district. The schools had already been closed, and the families that were stricken were quarantined. Many were dying from the dreadful plague which the doctors called influenza. Fortunately, however, no one in my family had contracted it so far, and all were still in good health. On reading the news of this devastating disease already having spread to Canada, I was alarmed. Only too well did I know the many deaths it left in its wake, and I earnestly hoped my loved ones would be spared. The speed of the epidemic and limited mechanisms for cooperation between federal and provincial governments exacerbated the problem and slowed the response to the outbreak. Saskatchewan's Bureau of Public Health had limited experience with serious contagions, and the monitoring and enforcement of health regulations relied heavily on municipal authorities, whose understanding and responses to the seriousness of the epidemic varied widely. Municipalities set up emergency influenza hospitals, supported by school nurses, teachers, and other volunteers, since many medical professionals were still serving overseas. Emergency committees recruited local women to prepare food and care for patients in their homes. Group gatherings were suspended and shops were closed. Some farms were abandoned or neglected as the illness overran families. First Nations reserves in industrial and residential schools where much of the indigenous population of Saskatchewan lived, were among the hardest hit. Gwen Hamlin and her family were living on the key reserve in southeast Saskatchewan in 1918. When the flu hit the reserve, it was terrible. My brother and I had it and we were kept in the southwest bedroom facing the church. We used to sit up in bed and watch who was digging the graves, as everybody seemed to help until they were also stricken. There was a Moses Brass who lived near us at the time, they had two children, a boy that I played with and a baby girl. The flu wiped out the whole family. Moses helped dig the children's grave, then his wife's, and then it got him. Eleanor Dieter of the File Hills Colony 
remembered the flu coming to her community. All the neighbors were down with it, and all the family were in bed with it, including Dad and me. Somehow, Mother didn't get it. We figured that she had it the previous winter. It fell to her to nurse us all, as well as looking after the chores. We had five or six cows milking at the time. Mother milked them all and fed and watered the horses, cattle, pigs, and chickens. We were shipping gallons and gallons of milk at the time and receiving a good price for it. When the flu struck, the farm instructor came to our place every morning to pick up gallons of milk to distribute to the sick. Dad never mentioned any charges. He just gave it away to help the sick people as much as he could. Across Canada, the mortality rate of Indigenous people living on reserves was more than five times the national level, and even higher in Saskatchewan. The November armistice brought little relief from the outbreak. Saskatchewan alone saw nearly 2,500 more deaths in that month. By January, more than 5,000 people in Saskatchewan had died from the flu. However, by then, the death rate from the virus was falling and people began to recover. The pandemic accounted for more deaths worldwide than the entire First World War. An estimated 100 million people perished from the disease, including over 50,000 Canadians, roughly equaling the number of Canadians killed on the battlefields of Europe. Although peace had been declared, it would be some time before all Canadian service personnel returned home. More than 4,000 troops had been shipped to Russia earlier that year in a vain attempt to stem the tide of Bolshevism. In addition, Canadian detachments would remain in garrison in Belgium and Germany well into the new year. Vic and Ern Swanston were among this latter group. As they made their way through northern France and Belgium towards Germany, they encountered many returning refugees coming back to their shell-shattered homes. November 14th, 1918. Lots of civilians are coming back. It's the most pitiful sight to see them. The luckier ones have dogs pulling little carts with all their stuff on it. But most of them are all women and children, loaded down like horses, with all their worldly belongings. They are on their way back to their homes, though a lot of them won't find any homes when they get there. Many of them keep asking us if such and such a town was smashed up by shells, and we couldn't give them much hope. Why? I know lots of these same towns that have absolutely disappeared, and all that is left is a sign with a town name on it, such as, This Was Court. For Gladys Matheson and her fellow nursing sisters in France, the work was far from finished. In the months that followed, her general hospital was occupied with caring for and discharging their patients and otherwise preparing soldiers for demobilization. She would remain overseas until June, when she returned to Canada. Perhaps of all combatants, the armistice was most welcomed by prisoners of war. Neil Taylor was released from Germany's Holzminden prison camp in December. He would return to Canada in January of 1919. Much of the Canadian Corps spent the winter in Belgium, and though anxious to return home, the men were finally afforded some measure of calm and relaxation. Billeted near Mons, Jacob Miller enjoyed the weeks of rest and good food that followed the armistice. However, his relief was short-lived as he received the news that his mother had been stricken down by the flu in November. In February, Jacob and his battalion were ordered back to England. Now billeted at the camp at Branshop, alongside several other battalions, hopefulness was again countered with tragedy as illness invaded the camp. The flu broke out again and raged badly. Every day there were a number of funerals. The oldest man in our battalion was carried off. He had gone to France with the original unit, had fought in almost every battle and survived them all, only to die here. Vic Swanston also returned to England from Germany in February to get married. Unfortunately, he and his new bride would have to wait for their transport to Canada. February 27, 1919. Getting damn sick of staying around here. Why in hell can't they send us home now that the war is over? There's going to be a hell of a bust-up among the boys if we're not on our way damn soon. For Canadian personnel serving overseas, demobilization could not come fast enough. Aside from the short-term commitments to garrison in Belgium and Germany, the Canadian government struggled to accelerate the process of bringing its people home. The timing of the armistice created a challenge as bad winter weather, ice-bound ports, and worn-out railways complicated efforts to repatriate soldiers as quickly as they would wish. 
The early pledge of first over, first back, which was preferred by many of the veterans, was dropped in favor of returning the men within their units, irrespective of time of service. This decision was a cruel disappointment to many of the men. The situation was exacerbated by the ad hoc policy of immediately returning home untrained drafts, and by the fact that the 3rd Division, which included many non-volunteer conscripts with comparatively little service, was given precedence over more veteran divisions. All of this served to create a toxic environment which ultimately sparked to violent dissent. Between November 1918 and June 1919, there were 13 instances of riots or disturbances involving Canadian troops in England. The worst of these took place at Kinnell Park on the 4th and 5th of March, when approximately 800 men rioted, five were killed and 23 were wounded. Commanding officers tersely reminded all troops of their individual responsibility to suppress any mutinous behavior. This seemed to have a moderating effect on the troops and the unrest eventually subsided. Spring brought with it a reopening of transportation routes, finally allowing the faster repatriation of soldiers back to Canada. On March the 12th, Jacob Miller and his battalion left Bramshot for Liverpool, where they boarded the Baltic en route to Canada. After disembarking, he continued home by train. His younger sister, Frida, recalled his return. It was a most joyous day when Jake came home from the war, but he looked sickly and had aged. He had grayed at the temples and was much more serious. It is no wonder he had changed. Spending long periods in muddy trenches, eating bully beef, and at times protected from enemy fire by dead bodies instead of sandbags piled high. March also saw the reunion of brothers Vic and Ern Swanston. Ern arrived in England on March the 16th, accompanied by the battalion's war-weary mascot, Billy the Goat. Despite stiff resistance from the authorities, the battalion saw their horned companion aboard for his journey to Canada. April 10th, 1919. Ern sailed today. Had another hell of a time before the authorities would let us get the old goat on board. But believe me, that mascot came from the west with us, went through the whole damn war at the front, was gassed at the Second Battle of Ypres, wounded by shrapnel at Festubert, and is going back, in spite of hell and high water, and the whole British Army and Navy. It's all a lot of red tape, anyhow, them wanting to leave him behind. Ern and Billy reached Winnipeg on April the 23rd. Ern recorded the arrival in his diary. Cold day, snowing on and off, pulled into Winnipeg at 8 a.m., the little girl who gave us the goat in 1914 met us at the station, quite a big girl now, and was sure glad to see old Billy again. Her people had moved here from Broadview during the war. We were taking the goat on to Regina with us, and we'll send him back to the girl from there. The 46th Battalion was among the last units to return home. The city of Mooshja declared a public holiday to celebrate the battalion's arrival. On June 9th, the returning men were greeted at the train station, and accompanied by bands and cheering crowds, as they marched up Main Street to the armory, where they were officially demobilized. By the end of the summer, most Canadian soldiers had returned home. On August 23rd, Vic Swanston and his new wife Florence arrived in Regina, where they were met by Ern. They and many like them would settle and start their newly married lives in Saskatchewan. The pressures of the war years had a significant impact on Saskatchewan. They exposed strengths and weaknesses in the province and in the relationships between its people, but they also provoked change and helped nurture pride in what had been accomplished. Political strategies through the conscription crisis and wartime propaganda fostered prejudice and set Canadian against Canadian, while government wartime priorities were shown to have neglected the health and well-being of many citizens. Despite local efforts, federal and provincial governments proved grossly unprepared for the outbreak of a serious illness or proper care of injured returned soldiers. These realities moved many Saskatchewan residents into action. Advocates for improved rural health care, including Violet McNaughton and the Saskatchewan Grain Growers Association, pushed for home nursing education for women and increased efforts to bring more doctors and nurses to often isolated rural communities. Saskatchewan's First Nations joined together with others to push for equality and better access to health and education 
as part of the League of Indians in Canada. Agricultural cooperatives began to take shape and labour tensions continued to escalate as Saskatchewanians and other Canadians demanded greater security in their work and a greater say in what they produced. Saskatchewan's experiences during the Great War would forever change the province and its people. Those who had remained and those who returned from the war had to adapt and try to move on with their lives. For some, it would be difficult, if not impossible, to put the war years behind them. The, the, the reaction sets in me. Uh, even after I came home from the war, I found myself wake up under the bed, dodging shells. <laughs> Which I never bothered me, you know, when you were there, it, it, you were taught all the time, you know, right, high strung. But when the whole thing was over, you'd have a nightmare about the war starting up again. The First World War formally ended on June the 28th, 1919, with the signing of the Treaty of Versailles. It was unquestionably a victory for the Allies. But the treaty's harshness provided a contentious and unstable peace. For Germany, Versailles was a complete humiliation. Driven by revenge, the Allies chafed against many of Wilson's generous 14 points, which included provisions for the open navigation of the seas, more equitable trade, and the establishment of a League of Nations. French Prime Minister Clemenceau quipped, Wilson bores me with his 14 points. Why, God himself had only ten. In the end, Germany was required to accept losses of territory, including Alsace-Lorraine and much of present-day Poland. They would retain the border region of the Rhineland, but were strictly forbidden to develop the area militarily. Germany also had to agree to pay massive war reparations, who require half a century to fulfill. Finally, they were forced to publicly acknowledge and accept full responsibility for the war. This stipulation was a hard pill for many Germans to swallow. Post-war Germany, disarmed and humiliated, became a weak and short-lived republic. Its resentments and frustrations, both real and imagined, fueled the later rise of fascism. The world immediately after the war was weary, indebted, and disillusioned. Intellectuals and ordinary civilians questioned the notion of human progress and scientific rationality that pre-war generations had taken for granted. Writers spoke of a lost generation. Artists struggled to depict the horrors of war. While Western economies slowly and unevenly recovered from their wartime efforts, many Eastern economies, ravaged by post-war inflation, barely managed to rebuild at all. It was not apparent to the celebrating crowds of November 1918, but in the ashes of the First World War lay the embers of the Second. It is often remarked that Canada and the other British Dominion had purchased pride, glory, and political autonomy during their struggles in the Great War, but they had done so at a staggering cost. Nearly one of every ten Canadians who served in the First World War did not return home. There are over 60,000 Canadians who now rest in war cemeteries in France and Belgium from the Great War. Others can be found in the United Kingdom, in the Middle East, in northern Russia and Siberia. Many were lost at sea. For Saskatchewan, the First World War saw more than 80,000 men enlisting in Canada's expeditionary force, about 42% of the eligible male population. Of these, 6,400 were killed while in service to their country, with many more coming home wounded in body, mind, or spirit. Few members of the Canadian Corps were soldiers by profession. They were a force largely made up of citizens, led by fellow citizens. They came from every walk of life, men and women, from many ethnicities. They came to render their service, and those who did not return left their country the poorer for their loss. Nonetheless, the nascent sense of national unity, which ran through the Canadians in Europe, had been galvanized through the crucible of war. The men and women who served in battlefields from Ypres to the Hundred Days brought back a pride of nationhood that they had not experienced before and would strive to promote and protect. A hundred years have gone by since the end of the First World War, and with it that proud band of veterans has passed from living memory to history. <laughs>
the scope and scale of the sacrifice made by these men and women still humbles us today. That is why every November the 11th, Canadians come together to honour our war dead and to quietly reflect on those words that were written in a war-torn field in Flanders many years ago.